It is the morning. This is the last time in the Pacific time zone for me for a while. The motorcycle has new oil, new gas, all the batteries are charged. I drank coffee. I'm good to go. So, we're off to Glacier. Say bye guys. Bye. <laughs> bye guys. <laughs> <laughs> nuts. <laughs> Jess and Cascade, thank you so much for your hospitality. I really did enjoy Pullman quite a bit. Maybe it's because I miss living in college towns and it's just so pretty here. Everything that happens in this season from here on out is because of you two giving me a spot to plan and prepare. Thank you. You could say that this episode begins a new chapter in season three. My plan is to navigate across the rugged Idaho panhandle into the mountainous ranges of Montana. I'll be going alone for quite a while in some new and unfamiliar territory. The territory I'm crossing is native to the Palouse and Nez Perce natives. For those of you that may remember, as I was crossing westward over Idaho in episode 24, I claimed I'd bring up the Nez Perce in a later episode. That episode is now. The Nez Perce people are Native Americans that have populated the Columbia River Plateau for the last 11,500 years. The name Nez Perce comes from French, meaning pierced nose. When French traders first came into the area, they met the Chinook and Nez Perce tribes and roped them all together under one name. The tribe that actually pierced their nose was the Chinook, but the name with the Nez Perce seemed to stay. So, compared to all the tribes I covered in the Washington Woes episodes, the Nez Perce are huge. The land they covered was larger and they had a higher population. In fact, the Nez Perce fought in the Yakima and Coeur d'Alene Wars, but I left them out because adding more names, tribes, and populations to the mix would have only added more confusion. The Yakima chief Kamiakin was also a one-quarter Nez Perce, and he used his ancestry and marriage ties to bring the Nez Perce into the fight against the U.S. territorial governments of Oregon and Washington in those wars. Tensions between the U.S. and the Nez Perce led to another conflict, this one being much different from the other wars between the U.S. and Native tribes. When the Cayuse War ended at the Treaty of Walla Walla in 1855, the Nez Perce were there as well. The first treaty between the U.S. and Nez Perce gave them all the land seen here in green. The reservation lasted all but 13 years until gold was discovered near the present-day city of Pierce. Thousands of prospectors flocked to the region, illegally founding the city of Lewiston on Nez Perce land. In this image, you can see Lewiston on the left side of the Snake River. Clarkston is to the right. The river acts as the border of Washington and Idaho, so yeah, I finally made it back into the gem state, which really helps me realize the progress I've been making. I've now left Washington after 14 episodes. In response to growing tensions, the United States signed another treaty in 1868, reassigning the Nez Perce to a much smaller reservation, which is seen in orange here. After this, there were two kinds of Nez Perce, treaty and non-treaty. These two groups were mostly split on religious lines as well. The treaty Nez Perce were prophesized and mostly Christian. The Nez Perce who still worshiped the native religions and the old way decided not to sign the treaty and lived off the reservation in their own territory at their own peril. The United States government couldn't keep white settlers from squatting on Nez Perce territory, leading to a lot of friction. Finally, General Oliver Otis Howard called a council and ordered the non-treaty bands to move onto the new reservation. The non-treaty Nez Perce leaders, notably Chief Joseph, considered military resistance to be a dangerous and vain endeavor. On their way to their newer, smaller reservation, they stopped to make camp and held a war parade where men on horseback brag about their deeds in battle. Horseback Nez Perce warriors began to tell tales of their unavenged relatives' as deaths at the hands of the whites. The ceremony, supplemented with alcohol, began to get out of hand. Several warriors went out on a raiding party that night and attacked white settlements on the Salmon River. Inspired by the bloodshed, more Nez Perce attacked settlements in the area. When this war party was returning, Chief Joseph and the rest of the non-treaty Nez Perce were already riding to meet with General Howard to appeal for peace. While doing so, a mobilized military force had already been sent by Howard to meet with Chief Joseph's band in battle. Howard considered peace futile and attacked. This led to the Battle of Whitebird Canyon, the first battle of the Nez Perce War. Chief Joseph's brother, Olicott, led the majority of the warriors into battle and won. The U.S. lost 34 soldiers with four wounded, while the Nez Perce only had three wounded warriors. The retreating U.S. soldiers left behind arms and ammunition that the Nez Perce gladly picked up before retreating eastward. The retreating Nez Perce were made up of 250 warriors, 500 women and children, and more than 2,000 livestock. Crossing over the Salmon River was the Battle of Cottonwood, where Chief Joseph and his warriors fought off the less mobile U.S. soldiers until their families escaped. Another band of non-treaty Nez Perce, led by Looking Glass, joined the retreat bolstering their numbers. 
Howard's forces attacked the Nez Perce at their camp from a valley using Gatling guns in an effort to scatter their forces. Instead, the Nez Perce used their fortified position to their advantage and once again held off the army until their livestock and families could escape. Fifteen soldiers died compared to four Nez Perce warriors. The Nez Perce then retreated through the Lolo Pass, one of the only corridors through the Rockies into the Montana Territory. On the other side of the pass was Fort Fizzle, a poorly manned temporary military barricade designed to intercept the retreating Nez Perce. Chief Joseph sent two white children they'd captured to the fort to ask them for safe passage, but they refused. They were outnumbered by only having 35 soldiers, but they were determined to slow the Nez Perce's retreat. Attempting to pass peacefully, Chief Looking Glass met with the soldiers and then claimed that they could pass peacefully. They ended up doing so, buying food and supplies from local ranchers and farmers in the valley. The Montana governor and the press commented on the bravery of the Nez Perce and the good sense of the Montanans who avoided bloodshed in the encounter. The Nez Perce turned south along the Bitterroot Mountains, traveling peacefully until they camped along the Big Hole River. At dawn, a force of 200 soldiers attacked the Nez Perce camp with the orders of no peace, no negotiations. Colonel John Gibbon, leader of the U.S. forces, fired indiscriminately at the Nez Perce whom he believed outnumbered him. The Nez Perce, still well-armed and well-fed, were able to hold off the U.S. Army and even managed to inflict a few dozen casualties. They would pick up the weapons of fallen and retreating U.S. soldiers, inflicting more damage on Gibbon. Gibbon wasn't well-stocked for the night and had no food and water. The Nez Perce immobilized his forces by sniping at them while the civilian Nez Perce escaped. It was the bloodiest battle of the Nez Perce War so far, but the natives pressed on, retreating farther south. They would take routes that they knew were off course to confuse the U.S. military scouts. Howard was catching up with the Nez Perce on their way to Yellowstone. When the Nez Perce encountered white civilians, a fight broke out killing a few white pioneers from the area. Chief Joseph turned their band to the east and toward Yellowstone. Howard had expended all of his efforts to catch up to the Nez Perce, but he was a day late. Chief Joseph's scouts found out the army was a day behind and decided to set up an old-fashioned Indian raid on their camp. He had several choice Nez Perce steal a few dozen horses from the camp to which the cavalry was called in to catch them. Upon catching up to the raiders, they were ambushed and the cavalry were attacked. The U.S. Army was completely exhausted and immobilized after double-timing their efforts to catch up with the Nez Perce. Their artillery and supply lines slowed them down, and their lack of horses after the raid left them even slower in their scouting efforts. Leaving their broken pursuers behind, Chief Joseph was free to move forward at a more leisurely rate, giving his people and livestock a much-needed rest. The Nez Perce were poised to seek out help from the Crow natives, the very same discussed in episode 14 of this season. Chief Joseph, desperate to secure his people's safety, would bet on the Crow to assist them. To reach them, however, he would have to cross the Yellowstone National Park, a move that was sure to disrupt even more settlers in the march of the Nez Perce.